Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is episode number 250. That's dos cinco cero. 250. 250. Imagine that. We're 250 episodes into this podcast. 250 episodes of me rambling, ranting and raving into this microphone and somehow... I have an audience. Somehow people listen to me. Some people download my podcasts, comment on my videos on YouTube, like some of the stuff I put out. It's insane. I'm not sure why this happened or how it happened, but I'm internally grateful for all of you who listen, who take the time out of your day to download, to leave a comment, to rate the podcast, to you know, send me an email, send me good wishes and all that sort of malarkey. It very, it, it, it's, um, it's, um, it's very well received. I am very, very thankful of that support. Even though I don't want the support, even though I'm a, my own man, I don't even want to give you a pat on the back, it's still very nice to have people out there who I don't know reach out and say nice things about what I do. So thank you very, very much. Um, I've got no real long-term goals for this. I just wanted to... The reason why I did this in, in general was for my mental health, right? Um, I was um, I tended to like you know have a lot of ideas and really strange conversations in my head and I tended and I wanted to uh provide myself with a platform where I could essentially you know brain fart all that shit out so I could leave myself clear to then think and worry about things in my life that I actually need to address right now usually the things that I'm ruminating over are things that are not really not in my control most of the topics I talk about are things that don't really concern me so that kind of gets all that stuff out of the way and then it leaves my brain able and with the necessary capacity and necessary ram space to you know go about my day-to-day life and and you know respond to the problems and the issues that i have coming about and um you know in just your everyday life i think that's probably the reason why some people get a bit some that's probably the reason why i kind of look down on people who who are kind of um obsessed with celebrity gossip and stuff right because the way i look at it is that i know that no matter what level of privilege you have no matter what level of you know whatever yeah mostly privilege that you have or wealth in your life i know for the most part everyone has their problems everyone has their issues so for anyone to spend any any amount of time um worrying or ruminating over what a celebrity is doing in their life is very much a waste of time um especially for those of us who are not very who are not in a good stable financial situation who haven't got their career um where it needs to be whose family are in complete disarray whose relationships are crumbling there are probably other things you should be worrying about as opposed to like you know what if 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 you know there's you should probably be worrying about what you, you should probably be worrying about your relationship with your mum or your dad or your siblings or your people at work or your status at work more so than you should be worrying about whether or not Carly, Kylie Jenner sent a cease to desist to somebody because they used the phrase rise and shine, right? That's not what you should be worrying about. But again, who am I to tell you what you should be worrying about? My point is, I'm thankful for everyone that listens. I'm very much thankful. It's very, um, I don't take it for granted because I know, you know, having worked in marketing, having worked in social media, having worked in community management, I know how hard it is to get, I know how hard it is to um, elicit any kind of reaction from people. Um, there's heaps of companies out there, heaps of individuals who have probably a far bigger reach than I do who, you know, release things and drop a podcast or put something up on YouTube and no one gives a flying fuck. I know how hard it is to get an audience to even look at your thing. So for anyone that is out there looking, whether it's one view, two views, 10 views, 100 views, 1,000, 10,000, I don't care. I'm grateful for every single eye, every single comment, every single like. It's something I'm going to hold dear and something that is, again, I'm encouraging me to continue to keep doing this. Even though I would do this anyway, even if no one was listening, it's still quite a, it's still quite a good um, feeling to know that other people who are strangers who don't know me also like what I do. Um, again, short-term and long-term goals, I think short-term, I'm going to upgrade it equipment i've said that a lot of times but i'm definitely going to do it in the next few weeks i'm going to get a new microphone a little mixing panel as well to make sure i can um you know gauge the i can probably control the the volume and the effects better i'm going to get a better my head a better camera too if not a better camera then probably upgrade around my laptop because the camera's fine but it's just i have to i have to um i have to downscale the bit rate because the ram can't basically handle um, operating at you know 1080p or whatever it may be so maybe just upgrade a ram on my computer or get another computer it doesn't need to be an apple raid it can be any computer that is able to um is able to take in all the data and all this video and audio that i'm using at the same time those are short-term goals and then long-term goals to get a studio um that might mean in my for my um for what i want to do I would, i'd rather not rent out a studio i'd rather just hire just rent out, sorry, a studio, flat or apartment somewhere, somewhere shitty. It doesn't need to be somewhere crazy. It can be even Ilford. I don't care where it is. But just get like a little one bedroom um, studio apartment. You know, what the types that have the kitchen, the type that has a kitchen and toilet all in one room. And just basically have that place just to kind of set up my studio permanently. 
have all my DJ equipment there so I can just go out there and basically mix and, you know, mix for four or seven hours and just uh, generally pay so I can go and make loads of noise. I think that's might be the next route for me going forward. So um, those are the short term and long term goals. But for now, if you want to support the show, just keep liking, keep commenting, keep sharing, keep leaving me reviews. That'll go a long way. People can find it. And that's it, really. Um, oh, merchandise as well. Probably might do in the future when I get a bit bigger, better audience, maybe bigger audience. I think I've I've got some cool ideas for merch. Obviously, with my experience and background in street and fashion, I think, you know, that might be a good way to kind of do some stuff. But I'm not really down for the whole sponsorship thing yet at the moment. I don't think it's going to yield as much of a benefit as maybe selling merch direct to consumer. But again, if anyone's out there who wants to sponsor the show, feel free to get in touch. But I think merch would be a good thing. I think I'll be, I've got some cool ideas about merch that I would like to, um, what it's called, that I'd like to uh, bring about and introduce to the public. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that happens. But until then, keep supporting the show. Like and comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And then we can continue making these. Anyway, so let's continue. Um, let's go on to the topics I have in place today. Loads of interesting topics, loads of stuff to talk about. Stuff that I found on the internet during the week that I want to obviously speak about a bit more, offer my expert opinion on, and then we can move on and carry on the rest of our day. So, number one topic, some sad news for all of you guys involved, especially for the people that are familiar with my channel, people that maybe discovered my channel through the video that I made about this place in the beginning or when it first opened. Um, unfortunately, news came or news broke that fold uh, Builders London's first 24-hour nightclub in Canning Town has unfortunately been temporarily closed or temporarily sus the license has been temporarily suspended. Um, we don't have much information as to what actually is going on, but uh, Fold were nice enough to put out a Facebook post yesterday morning and kind of broke down exactly what the issue was. Um, I'm going to talk about, I'm basically going to read what Fold said. I'm going to give my interpretation and then we're going to get some extra information that I've kind of now discovered from a new recorder that might... Um, uh, shed a bit more light as to what happened and also it might be a bit of a cautionary tale for some of the other clubs coming um you know that will eventually launch off the back of this because as distressing as this news is the natural the natural kind of events or the natural kind of a uh, process of things is that usually you know when an influential club like fold does eventually shut down because of all the good will because of all the good memories people have kind of um um I remember from that place they usually go in and to make their own little spaces too it always kind of spurs on a lot of people to kind of go on and do their own thing as well so don't be too sad about it because i'm sure people someone else kind of fill the spaces and also there might be a possibility that fold might reopen so let's not um get too down about the whole issue to begin with but this is a statement from fold <clears throat> posted on their facebook i'm sure other people have also posted it on theirs but essentially the message says the following is this from four posted yesterday at 9 a.m uh we regretfully um announced that our license to operate has been suspended by new m council this news has hit us by surprise and extremely hard last night serious accusations were brought to us and the local licensing committee as a result of such our license has been suspended and an immediate shutdown of the club without fair trial has been imposed we extremely we feel extremely blessed to have built a community around four that can't be compared or replicated every single one of you have made fold more than just four walls and sound system we have all created a new way of thinking a way of uniting and more importantly given refreshing meaning to the word safe space this is all thanks to you our community we are all currently appealing the suspension with the aim of uh, to maintain our operation for this weekend and events moving forward we offer our most sincere apologies to anyone affected by this decision we can assure you that we are working hard as we can to get to the bottom of this no matter what you are the reason we are fighting and you are our daily motivation stay put we are not giving up more information coming soon so i'm sure most of my um e friends out there most of the people in the scene are very aware with this situation this is a common thing that happens in london is super frustrating just as we get just as we are finally just as we find a spot you know just as it kind of decides to get just as it kind of gets more popular and people find it it starts to find its groove it's kind of found its way in terms of programming people are more aware of it um djs are uh, I'm, I'm sure people in the industry are really speaking very highly of fold so much so that other artists are flying down to come and play usually maybe even for a discounted rates they're more open to come and, and do it um you had richie horton playing there for fuck's sake the other week right so just as it's kind of really bubbling is just when the local council comes up and pulls the plug it always happens. It's a it's a kind of an age old story, especially if you're familiar with anything that's happened in Hackney Council with the clubs in Dawson and some of the other warehouse events that happened um, during the early parts of the year two thousands. You know that this is a common thing that happens. And unfortunately, I think for me personally, I would say the likelihood that Fold is going to reopen in the in in the way that it did re reopen and and kind of get back to operating the way it did previously is very much it's it's probably slim close to none. 
usually when um the local councils pull the plug on clubs like this it's it's an intimidation tactic it's a tactic to kind of store you to essentially bleed you dry uh it's a kind of a death by a thousand cuts because essentially if you suspend the club now this this basically throw the put out statement everyone's shared it we're all aware it's going to be closed the people who <laughs> who aren't aware that they're appealing it won't come on the weekend the club will be empty you'll have to close um two hours uh ahead of time that you does before so if it's closing at six now it'll probably have to close at four which means they'll have to open earlier which means they won't have many people in there because everyone arrives there at 12 or 1 a.m in the morning for the most part essentially going to bleed them dry to the point where they can't pay their security guards they can't pay their bartenders they can't pay the managers they can't pay the the sound guy the lighting guy like it's going to affect everything around the club and eventually the club will end up coming to close down now i don't want that to happen right i'm a big fan of fold if you guys know anything about my channel you know that uh, or about my podcast in general you know i've reviewed loads of events i went to at fold i was there at the first birth i was there at the first party at fold uh, fold's first party when it first launched it was one of the most memorable clubbing experience i've had in my life it really did remind me of the heyday of some of the kind of heady days of my early times in berlin right everyone kind of in the same space at the same time at the same point in life so all that sharing this same experience together it was electric i couldn't get over it i was thinking about it for weeks on end after the fact but I also know how shitty and how uncooperative some of these local councils are and how panicky they are as all these situations. Because, you know, there are maybe there, there's never been a point where I've seen a local council compromise of a nightclub and kind of offer some kind of reconciliation and kind of work to kind of sort these things out on their own. It's usually just one authoritarian figure such as the council or such as some local um, residents saying they don't want this thing, raising um, opposition about it. And because most people in the nightlife scene don't attend council committee meetings or whatever it may be, these objections get go unopposed and then essentially a few weeks later your club gets shut down and our mecca our community space our place where we go and essentially dance and as fold mentioned our safe space is completely ruined and, and stripped away from us it's really frustrating it's really annoying it makes no sense even more so because of canning town with the areas in i used to live in canning town i'm from canning town right so much so that i felt personally offended when i wasn't invited to dj at fold right because i'm from canning town that area is a place that i've lived there for most of my life right i lived it my mom still lives there right now um, I'm very aware of the area and when Fold launched my whole enthusiasm about Fold launching was where it was it's located in the middle of an industrial park surrounded by uh, garages uh, abandoned warehouses and delivery centers right the, the DHL delivery center is literally around the corner from where Fold is that's why I used to go pick up my parcels when I wasn't at home um, so it's it's one of the rare places in London club wise that's not that's not that's, that has no danger of affecting people the neighbors around it through nose pollution because essentially the the um, it's, it's separated by all the residential housing through a train station right a train line the dlr and a jubilee line run right in front of fold so anyone that complaining about the noise is talking rubbish because essentially there's a train running past that your house every i don't know 10 or 12 minutes especially during the weekday right so that's happening all the time so i thought that's the perfect place for a nightclub such as fold because you can you can have it open early or open late i mean you can have it open until the early hours in the morning um there's there's plenty of places that people can go to to grab some food mcdonald's around the corners off license around the corner too there's stations all dotted all around the area um of uh, fold you've got the jubilee line just in carrying town you've got star lane dlr and you've got west ham jubilee line further up the road so there's no real um encouragement once you leave the space for you to kind of hang around and just chat shit and make noise which most places have you know have um have kind of fallen by the wayside because of that and usually the security guards that fold are amazing too they usher everybody out they're usually on the streets ushering people to kind of get a move on make sure people are getting it in their taxis make sure people are walking and getting out of the sp and make, just essentially clearing the roads of people and of pedestrians in general and it's usually the, you know there's not much litter around there as well after you finish too it's just generally a place where you see people are generally trying to take care of each other and of the space to make sure this doesn't go away um and i thought everyone done a good job for the most of it i think people did a very good job i think the security is pretty tight they do a very thorough search in the beginning before you walk into the space they take pictures of you they take a copy of your id right it's like they do everything they can do to make sure it's a safe space in stores they have lockers installed in there to allow people to make sure you know i'm sure the levels of pickpocketing in fold are probably much lower than other places in london just because of the fact that they have lockers in there that you can you know chip in with your friends and make sure your personal belongings are stored in a safe place like it's just the perfect space to go and get fucked up on a weekend and listen to some amazing techno or electronic music that's the perfect place but i just don't understand the need of people in london especially local councils to 
I understand you don't really agree with everyone's way of life and everyone's kind of decisions to how to spend their free time. But I don't understand this real need to kind of dictate to people that want to go out at night or nightlife enthusiasts or people that want to go clubbing, dictate where they can go, um, um, how they can go there and how long they can stay there. It doesn't make any sense. I don't really understand that. And if anything, it just encourages bad behavior because what ends up happening is that that whole spell, that whole time period, maybe a couple of years ago when loads of clubs in Dawson and Hackney were closing, guess what happened? The natural reaction to that was all the, all the forest raves you saw happening. All the stuff that's happening in abandoned spaces um, early in the morning at weird hours of the day. Those are, those are a direct reaction to the lack of, of spaces or safe spaces or clubbing environments that we could go to and party. These promoters and these kind of attendees would then go and seek these other places that in, in general encourage probably worse antisocial behavior because there was no rules, right? There was no way of kind of policing anybody. There was no structure in place. Just basically people in the field with some speakers getting fucked up. And no one wants that, really, really, in, in a real sense. No one really wants that in London. You shouldn't be having a forest rave um, 500 metres away from a group of fa from family on a Sunday walk out. Do you know what I mean? It's not really the right kind of vibe. But the reason why that's happening is because we don't have enough safe space for us to go in club. And then you thought the one place that they do spring up and fold, which is the middle of East London, the middle of nowhere, that's open late. That's, again, that has a very particular crowd that goes to that kind of place anyway. It's not your general Shoreditch um, um, uh, Friday night um, kind of, you know, um, going out of a person that goes there. It's a very particular person that goes to a club that fold and you still feel the need to kind of pull the plug. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't make any sense. But again, I'm not surprised. I'm really not surprised. I'm bummed out for everyone involved in fold. I think... Um, Again, I think when I went there for the first fold party, I think I drunkenly said to somebody that worked there, you know, we really need to do it. We really need to make sure we look after this space because I knew straight away when I walked in that it's a special environment. And having read some information about people involved in fold, you know, it's no surprise that it was, it kind of elicited that reaction for me because all the guys involved in it are very much, you know, they're very aware of the scene. They've been to all the legendary clubs all over the world. They've DJed in places. They've been involved in different kind of, you know, labels and production arms, all that sort of stuff. So they're very much entrenched in the community. So they were able to take all the best elements of all these different, different clubbing environments and basically distill it into the fold. To say fold was basically a London copycat of Bergheim is a bit um, disrespectful. And I also think it's very um, disrespectful of Bergheim in the sense to think that you can just go to the Bergheim and just take its essence and apply it anywhere else it's not but they took the fundamental principles of how to kind of construct a safe space for ravers for club kids and somehow did it in a very london way and that's where i think fold really kind of was able to kind of separate itself from the pack and again it's just an amazing space isn't it like look at what is sprung up like the piece of shop in front of the piece of shop around the corner is basically uh a byproduct of fold right somehow because everyone was still out after 6 a.m some some very smart individual decided to open up a pizza bar spot place that was serving pizza and drinks and allow people to have a rave and a dance after six o'clock in the morning and then they've also got the unsound thing that they do or the yes yeah, the unsound the unfold the unfold thing they've got on sundays where they basically promote local artists not myself but you know some local artists get the chance to go and play there it's just essentially a place where they're taking care of their community and providing a platform but then again uh Cantown um, local council thought the need to kind of pull the plug. I'm not sure why. Again, it's very, it's probably a, you know, they kind of didn't know to spite their face really in, a, in an effect because I'm pretty sure, because I remember leaving Fold one evening and coming back on an Uber and driving down the road and seeing hordes of people out. Because you forget how, it's a 500 capacity uh, club, I'm pretty sure. But you forget how much people are actually in there. When I passed by uh, the West Ham Jubilee line, I was in the, I was in my Uber and looked across at the platform. It was packed full of people, of course, all wearing black, of course, all looking like they come from Fold. And I was like, Jesus Christ! Imagine the amount of money they've they've generated for the local business around the area, whether it comes from the off license that's on Barkin Road. Um, there's also a couple of breakfast spots that are opened uh, pretty early in the morning too that service a lot of the builders that work around in and around Canning Town. Um, there's also a McDonald's that's 24 hours that's around the corner too, around well around the corner from Fold, about 10 minutes, 15 minutes walk from there. They probably helped a lot of people, um, you know, sustain their business or maybe or, may, or maybe even operate another business. You know, there's there's always hordes of fucking mini cabs coming to and fro Fold as well. It's just a very it's just a very distressing time for everybody involved. Um, but then, on the other end of the spectrum, I did find this other article on Newham Recorder that might have basically um, shed some light as to why Fold is closing, why Fold is closing, and also might be an indication as to why maybe going forward there might be a there might need to be a bit more of an understanding of how club owners and club yeah club owners and club founders can work together with local councils to make it work because we have seen it work 
somehow right the warehouse project in manchester of course it's a bigger it's a bigger project it's something that maybe has been subsidized has been subsidized by the council in some respects the people involved in it are you know people that were involved in hacienda back in the day they have a very long and storied history in electronic music space and you know in opening night spots or nightclubs and in music production and all that stuff but they have they have found a way to make it work right so there has to be an element of some of our people who are out there putting their neck on the line and putting their money up and opening these spaces where you have to be a bit more cognitive of how you can um, collaborate and work together with these local councils in order to make sure these places survive and thrive. Because I don't think any local council member is really hell bent on making sure nightclubs close. I think they're just afraid of the consequences and they're afraid of how they're going to be able to manage it. Right. And they're also afraid of, you know, I'm pretty sure, you know, even though fabric, you know, have done a lot of good for London, I'm pretty sure that the recent deaths in fabric have affected some council members views on nightclubs and no one wants that stain on their record. Um, so people are very um, scared and wary about these places because they don't want to turn around, give you permission. And then suddenly, you know, a couple of kids died because they took too many MDMA tablets or they took MDMA tablets cut with fentanyl or whatever it may be. Right. So there has to be some um, give and take in that regard. Um, and I think this article from Neon Recorder probably um, sheds a bit more light as to why this situation happened and why, again, we need to be a bit more. <sighs> I don't know what it is, but. There's, there needs to be a bit more relationship between local councils and, um, again, the electronic music scene or the nightlife scene. Because at the moment, it just seems to be like, you know, one one side of the fence is completely opposed to it. The other side of the fence can't understand why they don't let you keep the club open until 10 a.m. That's to be a middle ground. I just don't think we can ever replicate what Berlin do because I, I just don't think sensibility wise and temperament wise in London, we have the ability to allow people to have fun and us just continue living our life. I think that's what you you see a lot in Berlin. People drinking openly in the streets is more so of a reflection of the fact that, but you know, most Berliners are, you know, in their own head and doing their own thing and not worried about what you're doing as long as you don't impede on them. But I think in London, we have this idea that somehow me enjoying myself is somehow an, I'm impeding on yours, on your enjoyment of your life, which again is not, it can be further from the truth. And there's a real lack of compromise here too. There is no compromise. It's, it's always one rule. It's always, it's always their way or the highway, really. That's it. But anyway, this article on your own recorder kind of maybe shed some light as to what actually happened. And reading between the lines, it might make complete sense. Maybe not. So this is an article from New York Recorder and the headline um, is quite inflammatory. And again, if they don't have, I'm sure they wouldn't print this if they didn't have absolute concrete proof. This is actually a fact, but it says the following. Accusations of a 200,000 uh, fraud, a 200,000 pound fraud and money laundering at Cannington Nightclub, which is kind of, you know, steep accusations. So the following, the council has shut down Cannington Nightclub after palace, oh, sorry, after police arrested two men running the venue on suspicion of money laundering. So if so now we've got the reason why folders closed, all right? So whoever founded it, whoever put the money up again, because this this is this is part of the issue with um, the lack of um, synergy or the lack of uh, cooperation between people involved in the nightlife scene and local councils to 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 generate the kind of money needed or to or to have the money needed in order to open a club, to buy the equipment, to hire the staff. You know, not a lot of people can do that, and you need some help. You need some assistance. Um, that system should come from local councils because eventually you are going to be an asset to that council. You are going to generate jobs um, indirectly through the demand of your space and the people that are coming and flooding it and other demands that spring from it, right? Imagine if a guy is selling hot dogs, you know, outside of Fold, suddenly, you know, his business gets completely wiped away because the club is closed down. Do you know what I mean? It's a big arm of his investment. Cab, cab drivers, local business owners, it, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So, so if we had a, if we had a way of somehow, um, if we had some kind of fund where, you know, cl you know, prospective club owners could go and maybe pitch their ideas, Dragon Den style, in order to kind of secure a bit part of funding, which also would then, would, which, would, which would come in, which would then be, um, you could work into that some kind of agreement where the club owners would have to sit down with local committee and local council, uh, people and kind of work through some of the issues maybe there'd be a mentoring program and just an idea that you know the whole premise behind what i'm saying is that there, there should be some kind of program set in place where there's a constant dialogue between the people that own the clubs and the people that live in and around it because again it's a harmonious relationship you can't just say as hipsters or as people in the scene oh just put your club wherever and don't care what anyone else thinks about it no we have to work together because these people have been there before you 
yes, in one respect, but also they live there. Let's just work with, together and make sure it's, it's, it's beneficial. It's like when you're at home and you're doing a little mix, you know, I do you sometimes at home, I make mixes, but I'm very aware that, you know, during the week, it's a bit of, a, it's a bit of an annoyance. So I try to end my set. So I try to kind of get my stuff done before 9 p.m. Generally, people don't sleep before 9 p.m. Generally, it's a kind of good enough time to kind of get your stuff done. And usually, if it's during the week, I have my volume at a certain level. And if it's during the weekend, I have it at a certain level. But because, again, it's just this idea that I'm working to, that I'm understanding the place that I'm in and I'm trying to be cognitive, or I'm trying to be empathic and I'm trying to be understanding of my neighbor's needs and wants, even without them asking me to do it. No one's knocked on my door and told me to turn the music down, but I've been very uh, purposeful about when I play my music at home, what kind of volume it's at, and et cetera, and what days I do it. And I think you could kind of extrapolate that and apply that to clubs too. There should be some kind of um, relationship there, but there isn't none. So then what ends up happening is that club owners allegedly have to then go and seek um investment or startup capital from other people right um and of course it's not you know you can't blame the owner of fold or the person that went to go get the money um it's not their fault the person who had the money has been involved in some nefarious issues right but that has probably come because there's no way that they can go directly to go and get some money that hasn't got, you know, extremely high interest rates or places that probably won't even give them the money in the first place. You kind of lead people, you force people down a way where they have to go and seek funds or seek operation in, kind of a, in a kind of quote unquote illegal way. Similar to the um, forest raves. Forest raves only happen because venues don't want them to host their parties there or they're too expensive. So you end up, you know what, fuck this, I can just do it myself in the forest. And then, of course, for the attendees, it's awesome. But for the people that live around the area, it's horrendous, right? You've got litter and rubbish all over the place. You've got people frolicking around the fields, making noise during the day. You're around your kids and shit. It's not what you want to see. But again, it comes down to us having a relationship with local councils. We need to sit down together and work together. But the article continues. Um, the National Crime um, Agency investigators are leading the case on top of the money laundering. Their alleged fraudulent funds were used to buy £200,000 worth of higher value DJ equipment at the venue. Police convict convicted people con uh, convicted of that level of fraud could face up to 10 years in prison, according to a statement from the Met Police officer. Officers arrested both the suspects and seized the equipment as they searched the clubs. So the people were in the club on October the 22nd. The investigation is ongoing. Fold had its license suspended on November 11th committee meeting where councillors were shown the police superintendent statement testifying it was linked to a serious crime. So I guess the council had no issue with the place beforehand. Maybe there might have been some noise complaints, but it was primarily based because of these people that have put the money up on Fold. They basically got the whole club in trouble again, which is un which is un um which is unfortunate really. Um it continues, the venue has permission to operate through the night and well into the morning on weekends as it's on an industrial site. Okay, awesome. But that police statement noted the premise itself has not frequently come to our attention as being associated with wide crime or disorder. So essentially, again, it's mostly due to the people that are again founding it, which, you know, which is again really unfortunate. Um, again, maybe it is partly because they weren't able to get funding anywhere else. But again, maybe there might need to be some due diligence in order who you get your funding from. But it's a very unfortunate circumstance. And I think they might have some room for appeal now looking at it because, you know, they can't help that the guy that was, or the guy or girl that was, you know, involved in fraudulent activities didn't get their money in legit ways. They have to maybe find a way to kind of distance themselves from it, make it aware or make it abundantly clear that they didn't know that this person was, um, you know, getting their money from, you know, illegitimate sources. Um, it's, they've also taken two hundred thousand pounds worth of higher value digital equipment, which is very unfortunate. I wonder how what kind of stuff that is. So, even if they do reopen, would they have any equipment to do to use? I'm pretty sure they will. Pretty sure people in the scene will cobble together and make sure they're supplied with the equipment they need. But that's super unfortunate, man. Um, <clears throat> it continues here. Uh, Fold said in November 14, state 15 statement, or which we read already. The announcement received more than 400 comments. Another man who said he lived close by the club praised his staff and management. People who live near haven't always have been supportive. The New York recorder reported complaints from residents last year. Problems included drugs, needles left on doorsteps, and noise from revelers heading home for a night out. The club said in a statement, at the time it was a strict procedure to stop residents being disturbed, which I very much agree with and can um, definitely co-sign. It added it strive to have the highest operational standards and urge residents to get in touch with any issues. Fold is set to make its case for the council on Friday the 15th, according to a council spokesman. Awesome. So we get to hear on the 15th what is actually is going on. I guess if you're familiar with Fold or you're familiar with New Am Council and you want to go support them, probably you should go 
probably um, more people in the scene should attend local council meetings in order to kind of make sure your voice is heard in these kind of places. But again, I think go, I'll go back on what I said previously. I think this case is probably has more um, of a reason to get appealed and probably win the appeal because again, it's mostly due to the people that were funding or helped to kind of um, front the startup cost for fold have been caught, you know, doing some dodgy stuff, which again, you know, you can't really speak upon that. We don't really know the details of it, but the club itself hasn't had any issues. There's been no real cases of, you know, people having drug overdoses and getting fucked up. Every time I've been there, the staff have gone over and above themselves to make sure people are safe and looked after. The staff members are pretty solid. The people that attend the place over, uh, every single day, every single weekend, for the most part, police the place really well. I guess that, that's why it reminds me a lot of Grease Mueller in Berlin. There's a very much a local community that always goes to Fold, that finds it a safe place to go, to, especially the club kids who wear fucking extravagant outfits and shit. There's only one place you can go and have that kind of freedom to be yourself and that'll be a place like that so i think hopefully fingers crossed the appeal will get heard hopefully we'll hear some good news in the future especially for people like me who bought tickets to the innovision uh, label night that's happening in december that sold out in record time as well and again that that's the annoying part of the whole thing right it's that just when group just when folders finding its groove i think if it seemed to me especially in a bit in the intermittent in the in the, in the middle stages when i because i would kind of catalog my fold journey even though i've been to loads of other nights i'll kind of catalog them in three different chapters i'd say the first chapter was when i went to the first fold party and then the second one would be when i went to see baba stilts play and then the third one would be when i went to see richie horton play right um i think each party definitely showed the ebbs and flows of st starting a nightclub i think the first party was essentially a celebration from all their friends and family um in and around the electronic music scene coming in and celebrating this amazing um you know a monumental occasion in london club history where we have a first london 25 nightclub of course that didn't transpire as we kind of thought it would the license is something they probably apply for only certain parties during the year to make it financially viable but nonetheless we were able to party for 24 hours that first opening night it was one of the best clubbing experience i've ever had in my life you can check out my previous video i'll link it up above there for you guys to check out but it's probably honestly one of the best nights i've ever had and then the second party i went to was when i went to go see baba stilts play right and that was again a good occasion but it's also the first time that i saw a bit of worry and a bit of kind of um uh, yeah like a bit of um nervousness around the staffing around what well, the time that i went it seemed as if you know they expected it to be a bit more full than it was it was probably half three quarters of the way for the whole back area was completely empty and then by the time eclair fifi came on and played at the end i felt really bad for her everyone had, everyone had cleared the dance floor everyone went home people were out in the smoking area no one was paying attention and she looked really down at the time but again that's just the standard procedure of being a you know up-and-coming dj trying to make your name i'm sure she wasn't tripping on it but again it goes to show that maybe they weren't as popular of a spot as you thought it would be then i buy a ticket to go see or i buy a ticket on the second hand market on the resellers market to go see richie Horton play which again you're not really sure if that's a real um indication of demand because people sometimes buy up tickets and resell them and no one's there at the event or sometimes they only allocate a small amount online and then leave the rest of the door you don't really know what these things are <clears throat> if it's really true or not but then when I arrived at Fold Nightclub at 12 o'clock, at half 12 in the morning, the queue was wrapping around the side of the building and we had to wait more than an hour and a half to get inside. And by the time we got inside the nightclub, usually sometimes when they make you wait an hour and a half, you're like, oh man, there's no one in there. When I got in there, it was packed. I've never seen it that packed. There was a queue for the lockers, there was a queue for the bar, queue for the toilets, queue for the smoking area. There was actually a security guard policing people coming in and out of the smoking area. That's how ram it was. It was insane how packed it was. And I was like, okay, cool. Fold has finally found its groove for folders finally popped into the mainstream and then of course on top of that when the innovation label night got, got announced of course innovation is probably a bit of a cheat code because they have a very innovation have a very rabid fan base you know i'm probably included in it too um a lot of kind of fanboys who will buy and attend anything to do with innovation um um affiliated artists or the label itself but that event has essentially sold out as soon as the tickets were released i'm not sure if that's the first release they're gonna release more later on but that was another indication of just how popular fold is so i'm really hoping that um canning town is able to kind of see the benefit or new is able to see the benefit that fold is bringing to the local community i still think there's probably more people in the area that are happy that fold is there i'm sure most people around the surrounding areas too are happy fold is there especially when the, with the with the transport connections and i think they can 
find a way to kind of make sure that there is harmony between the both camps maybe it's just an issue with the fraudulent activities of the guy involved in the funding and everything else is fine but regardless hopefully this kind of encourages them to be a bit more dialogue going forward and i'm really hoping fingers crossed today we have some good news um this weekend about fold reopening and for those of you that are attending parties happening uh, this weekend too um and if you're in the area i'll definitely encourage you to go to the council meeting on the november 15th to lend your support to the whole fold team so yeah um big up fold and hopefully those guys live long and live prosperous um okay that's that news what else we move on to something else what else do we have here um oh Oh, oh, oh! What else we have here to talk about? Let's, you know what? Let's go into some. Let's go into some um trainers and I know let's go into some other club wear stuff as well. Why not do that? Let's do some clubbing stuff as well. Let's talk about that. So, um, in other clubbing news, I'm sure you guys are aware, or some of you guys have heard, there's a nightclub opening up at Croydon. This is on the back of my conversation about fold, but this is interesting because this is something I've kind of spoke about previously. I'm not sure if I've, you know if my voice is traveling across the internet airwaves and people have heard my message but this is kind of similar to the thinking i had when it came to being able to somehow create spots or create safe spaces for people who want to go out and club and want to go out and stay out until the early hours in the morning creating spaces where they can go and enjoy themselves and also spaces that don't infringe on local residents you know uh general um enjoyment of their area too wherever it may be so this news broke um recently or just a, a few days ago and re as reported by a resident advisor here london is getting a new nightclub a new club called phase the 500 capacity venue same size as fold is opening up in croydon in december and i think i mentioned previously that when fold opened i was very infused about fold being the first 24 hour nightclub or just being a, a nightclub in general that opens until 6 a.m there's not many of them maybe um uh what's that place egg nightclub as well closes at five maybe a few others there's a few others are speakeasies that close at five but an actual nightclub that closes after 3 a.m there's not many that you can find my idea when fold opened was that london uh the london mayor or the london night czar and um, that amy lammy that useless woman hopefully that she can kind of pull her finger out and somehow drive an initiative where we have one um late night spot in each area of london north east south west we have one area that you can go to if you're a local resident or you're somebody that's involved in a local electronic music scene or whatever it may be a place that you can go to and rave in peace a place that it doesn't infringe on the local residents either a place that's far away from all the major residential hotspots because i think each area in london has its equivalent of canning town has an industrial parky sort of area that you could go and set up a bespoke nightclub have it completely insulated with soundproofing and make sure and of course if it's near a station that's going to be advantageous but you can allow it to be kind of self-contained in that area so it doesn't bleed over into other areas of uh, of that of that place where basically the nightclub is located and i thought that would work out pretty well because then what it would do it was it, it would ev um, inadvertently ease the foot flow and the traffic in other areas dotted around your town or city because i think part of the reason why dawson went through such a fucked up moment with licensings was because they hand that license to everyone at one go then essentially a whole wave and movement of hipsters and scenesters and people involved in the scene flooded that area all at once and it just couldn't handle the capacity. There were just so many different people packing in different spots that were all open in different varying amounts of time, different capacities, different licensing laws. And essentially it kind of crumbled and essentially the, 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 the unintended victims were the local residents. But I think you can ease some of that pressure by allowing the people that do want to stay until 6, 7, 9, 8, 10, 9 a.m. in the morning, allowing them a spot to go to will then ease the pressure on your local bars and clubs. Because if you've noticed, most people that go out at nighttime, you have probably noticed an upsurge in people um, not going out at nightclubs, but getting fucked up at bars, cocktail bars, wine bars, um, nice restaurants, wherever it may be. Right? People are kind of using those places and meeting up with friends as a kind of as a way to kind of have a, a night out in that respect. Especially if you go to a bar in East London that has like a relatively decent DJ, you can probably get away a with having your kind of quote unquote night out in like a local bar on the strip in, in Shoreditch High Street. You can probably do that in Dragon's Bar because they usually have a, a half-decent DJ, great drinks, great ambiance. It's open until about 1 a.m., station right around the corner. You can get your thing and go. But again, you can ease the traffic in a place like that by allowing people to go to a nightclub somewhere located in East Industrial Area, North, West, South, 
uh, whatever it may be. And I think FaZe might be the answer to Southway, right? Um, especially it being in the depths of Croydon, there's only a certain group of people that are, are going to want to go there. But anyway, the, the issue is, this is the article. Um, FaZe, a new nightclub art space in London, will open its doors next month. Croydon venue, comprised of two uh, club night floors and a studio, has a 4 a.m. license and a 500 capacity. On Fridays and Saturdays, FaZe will run parties and with additional midweek events for live music and comedy shows. The programming schedule is still to be announced. If this is to be announced, I want to make it known here, make it my voice clear. If it's to be announced and you guys are looking for DJs, holler at your boy. I play most of the best of everything. Good disco, good house, good techno, good funk, good soul, hip hop and R&B. If you need a DJ to come and fill in your slots, to bring some people down, again, to add a bit of authenticity and a bit of ambiance and a bit of fun and a bit of carefree attitude, holler at your boy. Because this is such a great idea. If we can... If Fold can survive, hopefully with this um, appeal that they're going to do on Friday, and we've got the additional phase, we've got two spots in London open, one at six, one at four, south and east London. Then we have one more maybe opening in maybe, let's say, Ealing Broadway somewhere in west London. Another one maybe opening up, um, especially with the fact that Cause is going to close soon, something that can kind of maybe uh, fill in the space for Cause. That'll be super beneficial. Hopefully that happens. Um, anyway, the article says the following. Phase is located... Um, in the centre of Croydon, within walking distance to the three railway stations, the venue is a project of Lambeth Group and the team behind the Brixton spot, the Prince of Wales. Oh, awesome. So here's the video too that kind of details some of the things going to be happening at uh, phase. Let's quickly watch this video. So, so far, we haven't received a lineup, so that's TBA, but the, the venue itself looks fucking beautiful. I love the lights and lamps above the bar. Um music and art space i'm also encouraged that they're going to do comedy shows all during the week i think that's a good way to kind of because I'm, I'm pretty sure running a club or, or setting up a club and making it financially you know successful must be such a hard job to do um especially during the week especially during slow months so the idea of having it be like a harbor or a spot people can go to during the week and also have comedy shows or art exhibitions is going to be beneficial most places do that anyway because it's the easy way to make some money during the week but it's very it's very nice that they're kind of making it a staple right now and putting it front and center like a new muse and art space so again it kind of you know maybe kind of softens the blow of it being just a nightclub people can get fucked up in but again even if it, that is the case it's a welcome addition let's carry on with the video <laughs> Oh, nice. The layout looks interesting. So, essentially, you've got a bar, I think, in the middle, like an island, kind of island bar with a stage. Looks like on the right-hand side a little bit. Is that a stage there? Let's just look at that a little bit different because we don't really know what it looks like unless we kind of watch this video. Yeah, so we've got like a stage with amazing bits of lighting in it. Um, so, maybe the speaker box is there. There's an entry. There's a booth to sit down in. It was fairly, fairly interesting. I'm really interested to go check out what it's going to look like. I'm definitely going to go. As per usual, I can try and go to all the first nights of all these events because... It's good to kind of gauge an idea as to where it kind of, you know, where it started from and kind of where it's going in the, in the future. But yeah, it looks really cool. I like it, man. What a great idea. Again, um, hopefully we get more of these. It's a collaboration with, um, what's it, Lambeth Group and the Prince of Wales as well. So there's obviously some kind of synergy going there, some sort of communication and cooperation. Hopefully other councils see this as a way to kind of, again, inject some new life, inject some new money. Um, maybe, again, um, the possibility of also... Because you, you have to understand that when scenes are kind of built around these kind of places and people inevitably move to those areas too, right? So they come in and they, they become um, kind of taxpaying residents, after a while because then they want to set up spots they might want to open up a studio themselves maybe have um maybe kind of you know open up their own nightclub it's going it's only it's only um it's only a net benefit a net positive for everyone involved really so i think i would like to see more of these uh spots pop up especially the collaborations with local councils and hopefully with fold winning this appeal we'll have two spots in london open up open and after 3 a.m which is definitely going to be a benefit for everyone involved so definitely check it out uh phase um, it's not open just yet at the moment. Opening in December, um, you probably could be able to find a nightclub listed on Resident Advisor to get some dates and see who's going to be playing. But no dates already kind of confirmed now at the moment. But definitely check it out if you're that way inclined. 500 capacity place, probably a bespoke sound system right in the middle or right in the heart of a Croydon surrounded by all the three major railway stations. So no danger of anyone missing their trains and stuff. So yeah, definitely check that out if you're that way inclined. I really recommend it. Um, I'm happy to see more places pop up. Okay, next on the list, what do we have here? Na 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 na. What else we have? What else we have? Oh, Svenvar, Svenvar, Svenvar. 
Sven Var gave a pretty cool interview with Mix Mag. Um, I'm not sure what this is tying into. Maybe he has a book or a record out at the moment, but maybe it's just an interview with an absolute legend. I'm not opposed to that myself. But there was a very interesting quote here that I found really cool that I wanted to speak about. Um, and it's the following quote. Was it also called? Da, da, da. Okay, this is a quote that I kind of, again, maybe it's something I only have to speak about for myself just to kind of gain a bit more of a just to kind of make humble me down a bit more and kind of maybe drive me to a bit more a bit more hard work when it comes to selecting tracks for mixing and stuff but this is fairly interesting so um what he said here let me find a quote for you we just copied that one there yeah so this is the quote from sven Varb that i thought was really interesting so this interview from uh mix mag and it's titled 100% Vinyl, Why Sven Var Will Never Abandon Turntables. His decade-long love affair means uh, more work, more prep, and a hell of a lot more luggage. But Sven Var is not changing his tunes. Um, this is, of course, a really insightful article, of course, you know, detailing Sven Var's love for vinyl. The fact that even Sven Var even DJs at the boiler room using vinyl, which is absolutely insane. If you're familiar with any kind of boiler room venue, you'll know that most of the spaces that these guys use for boiler room aren't necessarily, you know, um, clubbing, aren't necessarily vinyl friendly. There's not a lot of um, air conditioning or a lot of ventilation passing through those places. Records can warp due to the you know just the heat and the in general from conducted from the, the the equipment and people's body heat in there the lack of ventilation you know can maybe make your record skip and shit uh people beating and jumping around next to the table can obviously affect that as well so it's not the most conducive area space to kind of use vinyl but Sven Vars always played vinyl when he's at Boiler Room. Always. Always played vinyl. It's fucking insane. Like, it even, even does that at festivals. Sometimes they'll have, like, a little windshield. I think there's a picture here up here that she shows it. Yeah, sometimes he has this little windshield that kind of helps to protect it from all the elements. But still, man, it's a hazardous, hazardous thing to do. And if you've been... If you're familiar with playing on vinyl, as I have in the past, or if you're uh, just learning how to DJ at the moment... Especially, do you remember when you start DJing and you're not sure how to beat match properly and you're afraid of missing in a track because you you're afraid of it clanging? That's essentially the feeling I get every time when I mix with vinyl. Because you just don't know, right? You just have no idea. You, you, you let the skills, you lack the practice, you lack the technique to kind of make it work. So I can only imagine how nerve-wracking that must be for me mixing at home or mixing in a pub surrounded by 10 people. How much more for Sven Var on the stage in front of 30,000 people DJing on vinyl, do you know what I mean? Like, he takes fucking balls of steel. But anyway, it says here at the, at the end that really um kind of touched me in terms of what he says about, um, ba -ba -ba, about records, right? So here's something he says about records. So let's just read the beginning part of it. It says, um, um, another issue for vinyl only selectors is that economy uh, economic situation for labels and artists means that so much music released today is digital only. Sven insists that anyone who wants to give him music provides their tracks on a dub plate as well as by, as pressing his own. I've told all young DJs and producers, don't give me a USB stick. If you want me to play your records, you have to at least give me a dub plate. That's impressive. That's so also cool because what it does is that it immediately self-selects people who are really about this life because most producers who can't be bothered are the producers that probably Sven Var shouldn't be talking to in the first place. So if you go out of your way to make a dub plate for Sven Var, uh, right or to make an edit or to just get it ripped onto vinyl in the first place you know that you're really really a committed and you're probably are at the level where you think your stuff is ready for us because i wouldn't want to chuck my first couple of demos so far as direction right you'd want to obviously give him your best work and um again there's no guarantee he's going to play it but that is pretty cool that he does that actually really really cool especially somebody of his level it's just insane that he does that right this guy flies around on private jets and he's you know willing to accept dub plays from randoms that's pretty cool um Every week I'm on the road, he says, someone will give me a record with a note saying, please play my music. This happened to Emmanuel Stati, who releases who releases with us a lot now. Oh, amazing. He created a beautiful sleeve with professional artwork and everything. That's what it takes, right? Again, these are these are the, um, the unintangibles, the things that people don't talk about that kind of allow you to kind of progress up the ranks in any of your perspective fields. Um, it's something I've, I've been very cognitive of. I've been very aware of like every time, imagine if I get interviewed for a job somewhere and it asks me for a proof of work. I sometimes, I sometimes go out my way to send them. Oh my Jesus Christ. I sometimes go out my way to send, let's put some um, airplane mode. I sometimes go out my way to send the label or to send, sorry, to send the employer 
a complete social media plan, some con some kind of mock-ups of work that I think will work well for them. I really got my way to make sure that I try to demonstrate that I can do the job. And the idea behind it is that going above and beyond is going to differentiate you from the crowd of people that are also vying for the same position. And I think it's, it's even more so, and it's even more important in the DJ world where essentially everyone's a DJ. It's a job that most people can do if you've got some taste in music. So the bar of entry is pretty low. So you have to really differentiate yourself. You have to really make every possible effort to differentiate yourself from the group, whether it's creating custom artwork for your mixes, whether it's put, um, putting some money behind your uh, uh, social media posts, whether it's kind of clipping stuff and putting spreading them on media, whether it's trying to get press, whether it's um, appearing on other people's podcasts, whether it's throwing your own parties and putting your money up that way so you can showcase yourself. There's loads of avenues that you can do, but there's many things that you should do in order to separate yourself from the pack. Because if you're just going to turn up and play music on the USB stick and hope that's going to get you where you need to get to, you've got another thing coming because there's other people out there doing much more than what you're doing in order to kind of get just the bare minimum. So you really, especially in a competitive market, like, you know, any kind of, uh, hip metropolitan city like London you know you're really trying to fight with the best of them to make sure your voice gets heard in that regard so that story from this Emmanuel Satie is definitely a really cool uh, story you know he went up to up to turn bar made cut him a exclusive dub plate made an entire record sleeve out of it um, linear notes all that sort of malarkey handed to Sven Vine of course and it obviously helps if the music's good but usually if someone's going to that effort it's not going to be shit stuff you know, you know you can't polish a turd but then the bit that really struck out to me that really kind of drung home is something I'm going to definitely um, um, use as a, as a guiding principle stuff that I'm doing here at home was the following I also have somebody who buys me records, Svenbar said. I give them a budget and they gather up the music for me, sending packages every two weeks. Then I sit in my rocking chair at home and I do my homework, listening to all of them from start to finish. I don't skip through. I need to hear the whole record. Now, if you know, if you're familiar with Svenbar or if you're not familiar with him, right? Let's just take, let's just, let's just pause a minute to see how crazy that statement is, right? If I do Svenbar and I go on Resident Advisor, Let's look at Sven Vaz's touring schedule, right? And see how nuts this is. Like, this guy is sitting down in his home somewhere with his kids surrounding him, vying for his attention, and he's listening to records from the beginning to the start every two weeks. Like, going through every record that gets sent to him and selecting the songs himself. It's insane. Look at his, look at his tour schedule, right? Look, look at that tour. I've got, I've got it on screen now, and it's just insane. Look at that tour schedule already for the past. Like, he's essentially been DJing every week, essentially, if it feels like, right? Let's look at November. Look at the dates. Look at the look at the places that he's at in November, right? It's all split up, of course. Like he does the first two weeks and the last two weeks, but or the first one, the first week and the last two. But look at look at the locations. Look at the locations: France, Switzerland, U.S., Miami, Chile, right? Then he goes to October, increases again. Um, Holland, uh, Germany, 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 Italy, September, and these are all dates, probably a couple of days in between each other, right? Um, he's DJing in Germany, Germany, IB for Spain, Greece, Dusseldorf, uh, United Kingdom and Spain. All this traveling and somehow this guy finds the ability to go through records and listen to them, um, you know, all the way through. What excuse do I have? I have no excuse. I really have no excuse. And I don't think anyone else listening to this who's also a DJ has any excuse either. You have to do the homework. And that, I think, again, is what separates the good DJs from the great DJs. I think there is this argument out there that if you want to get more gigs, you have to produce and you have to kind of, you know, have, um, you have to be that kind of a Swiss army knife of DJs, right? You, you can do various different genres. You're, you know, maybe an expert in one, but you can DJ probably to a good standing in other genres. Um, you have the ability to make a track. You can make edits. Those things are going to obviously add to your law. And of course, if you're able to make a producer track and it blows, it becomes the next big thing. You could then kind of ride that wave in order to kind of get more bookings. But usually those producer DJ guys kind of fizzle out. Usually people realize quite quickly they're not really good DJs. They don't really have good musical taste. They're just able to make good songs, right? Which is different from having good taste. But having good taste and being a really good DJ, I think of someone like Gerd Jensen and I think of the kind of stuff that he listens to. I think of the publications that he reads, the videos that he watches. Those will all influence the kind of songs that he's going to play in the music scene. I think that's where, that's where, that's the work that's needed to be done behind the scene before you even get in front of the decks, which is sometimes why I'm of the belief that sometimes this, this um, focus on mixing and blending and how you do that, how you drop tracks is ridiculous. And sometimes even the social media stuff, putting your hands in the air and clapping is also dumb because I think part of the work that really separates you, why DJ Harvey is a legend that he is now, is that people were raving and hollering about the breadth of music genres that he played throughout his entire set. 
Now, granted, it's six hours, but he was able to take you on a complete musical journey. And that's what people were raving about. I never really heard people talking about his mixing or about, you know, whatever effects. People just were talking about his song selection. So imagine being that kind of DJ. And that only happens because you've done the homework at home. You started at home, you've gone through the records, and you've done everything that you can do to make sure that the records that you're playing are a reflection of yourself and also elicit some kind of emotion, some kind of feel, some sort of texture, some sort of vibe. They're not, they're not necessarily just, you know, the top 100 tracks selected from Beatport. They're actually you going down and picking album cuts. And I've been always a fan of cutting or picking beat cuts anyway. I, I hate playing the title track of any EP. I like to select a couple of tracks that I think that, uh, probably work but especially if it's a track that everyone's banging and rinsing out i'll purposely not play it and maybe play the b-side maybe play an edit just to kind of throw it off a little bit give myself a little bit more of a challenge and also offer something different for the consumer and again if sven bar can do that we can do that too um but yeah i recommend you check out the interview it's really really informative it's a real cool love letter to basically turntablism and you know there's no big avid there's no bigger advocate of that than Sven Vaar. So definitely check it out. Available now on Mixmag. The title is 100% Vinyl. Why Sven Vaar will never abandon the turntables. Link will be attached in the show notes for you guys to check out. So next on the list, what do we have here? We talk about Sven Vaar. We spoke about Sven Vaar, didn't we? Um, next on the licks, licks, licks or list, list is this shoe. Talk about sneakers, right? We always have to include a bit of sneaker news in this podcast. That's the most essential information I want to get out there. But this is really cool, right? So Essex brings back its 1989 OG Gel Light Free Citrus. Long title, loads of names, loads of words, but by and large, you've got the meaning of it. And I like the lookbook that they've used. Essentially, they've used this a massive beefcake bodybuilder dude to advertise the shoes. Not sure what the reason is. We're going to probably read it in the copy below. But as a shoe, just kind of going back to what I spoke about previously about the glory years of sneakerhead. And, you know, how collecting has kind of changed over the years and it's essentially turned into, you know, people just collecting the most rarest shoes with the most value in order to kind of flip it, you know, a few years down the line, which, you know, I had nothing against, but come on, you know, let's do some more. So this Asics, um, again, reminds me of that era during Crooked Towns where I think there was an era where Asics was kind of blowing up. It might have been in part due to the whole um, Amsterdam Pata crew. I know it's a very popular shoe around them and around those dudes. They were kind of kind of pushing that shoe really, really hard. And I think at the time I was kind of hesitant on the Pat or the SX Gel Light because I think it's got a split tongue in the front. Pretty sure it doesn't have a tongue that you can actually, you know, pull up and down. And there was a moment in time when most of the kids in my school were tying their shoes a certain way. And it only was it was only beneficial if your tongue was a conventional tongue that kind of flat forward. So this shoe kind of made it hard to kind of have that kind of style. But I really like the shape of it. I like the shape. I like the fact that it was extremely 80s, 90s influenced. Um, you got the whole tech side of it. You got the idea of the different color um, EVA on the polyurethane on the midsole. You got the black outsole with the white midsole, which is a classic staple of kind of 90s or 80s uh, running athletic shoes. And just in general, the kind of citrusy blue pops everywhere were just something I kind of really resonated with. I remember getting a pair of the gel light freeze. I think I got like a brown and a purple pair. I forgot there was a collaboration. I forgot what the collaboration was with, but I remember giving them to my brother and he fucked them up quite quickly. But again, a real a real underrated shoe that only came to prominence because a couple of sneakers decided not to buy the conventional standard Air Max 1s, Air Max 90s, all that sort of stuff, and decided to kind of branch out and kind of discover some gems, unearth them. And then, you know, like a few, t- you know, 20 plus years down the line, Assets is now going back in the archive and, re- and resurrecting them and bringing them back again as a retro. So it goes to show that if consumers are a bit more intentional about what they buy and kind of, you know, champion the stuff that's a bit under rate, that's a bit under the radar, brands will recognize it because, you know, again, they're capitalists. Um, they want to make sure they maximize their profits. So if people are buying this item, they're going to go out and make sure that they kind of produce it, produce more of them so you can keep buying them. So if you're intentional in your purchases and you go out there and you kind of have a bit more of a, of a curious eye, you're looking for stuff that isn't well known and you're trying to make that cool. You're basically trying to take a shoe that no one gives a shit about and trying to swag it up and trying to make it look a bit more interesting on social. That's when you really, that's, that is essentially what I deem as sneaker culture. Or being a sneakerhead but going and buying the most limited shoe that's only available in certain locations and then just having 10 of them in your house and standing next to the box that's not sneaker that's being a corny kid in it and no one wants to be a corny kid but this um this um this um collaboration looks really cool oh, it's not collaboration it's a re-release of a shoe uh 1989 gel light uh free it's the 20th anniversary it says here on the on the headline as well You've got this amazing bodybuilder dude um, advertising it, which is super cool. I'm not sure if if it's because the Asics Gel Light 3 has a history of 
uh, bodybuilders. You know, again, that's a split tongue. Remember, she's got a split tongue in the front. Um, not sure if that's the history of it. If it's kind of very popular in the weightlifting industry, or if it's just like a cool image to have, which I definitely do agree with. You got a picture here of the of the bodybuilder's feet surrounded by um, lemons, completely rinsed out, and he has immaculately oiled legs. <laughs> um, it's really fucking cool, man. Really fucking cool advert. I really fucking like it. Again, because sneaker sneakerhead um, or sneaker photography and lookbooks is kind of boring, right? They usually do the same old thing, especially hype beasts. They love those fucking pictures of, you know those guys wearing fucking pinroll jeans and you know always pointing their toes down at the ground somewhere always kind of half running and jumping places it's fucking annoying or or the classic one where they're kind of jumping up and down a puddle right it's all stupid fucking photography but this at least looks a bit more interesting right you've got you've got basically this amazing beefed up dude wearing a bodybuilder essentially wearing these amazing really delicate trap really delicate trainers with um lime green shorts you've got again some cool imagery here with limes and lemons surrounding it and just again very very fun uh very carefree doesn't take yourself too seriously and you can honestly see yourself pitch you, you can honestly maybe see yourself picturing you picture yourself wearing these shoes and of course you know as a byproduct as well there probably are some dudes out there that probably think hey if these shoes make me look like that guy i'm definitely gonna buy him because he's fucking ripped um but here's a here's an article from the from hype beast says the following the faith anniversary of the joe light free is right around the corner and Essex is set to kick off the festivities with a little early uh, by bringing back the OG Citrus colorway, an original style that helped launch the Joe Light 3 back in 1989, the Citrus offers a crisp look lovingly recreated in celebration of the silhouette's impending milestone. Um, the Joe Light 3 has grown into a street style favorite over the three decades. Um, list of collaborations from A Few, Ronnie Feig, Atmos, and Beams, just to name a few. Using a crisp white as its primary color, the Citrus calls a point where value, blah, blah, blah. The former, the, the, um, also, any other club, any other news about the video? Check out the um, AFU's humorous images and campaign video featuring German bodybuilder Steve Ben uh, Bentin right here. And for more of the SHA like click here. Okay, so this is a video as well to back up the entire thing. I'm pretty sure it'll be is it gonna be in German? Ich muss dir leider mitteilen, dass wir bisher wirklich noch keine. Yeah, so it's in German. I'll link the video in the show if you guys to check out, but it's a pretty cool video. It's a dude, I think he's in therapy somewhere. And then here's obviously the bodybuilder eating lemons and wearing the shoes. Mamma mia, that's insane. <laughs> it looks super cool, man. It was really fun. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I really recommend you check it out. I'll link it in the show notes for you guys to see the whole article on Hypebeast with the video attached to the bottom. There's some cool images here again at the bottom here from IGTV on their collaboration page. And yeah, definitely check them out. Available on November 15th. So that's tomorrow on Friday for 120 euros. Definitely check them out. The Citrus or the Asics Gel Light 3 in Citrus Colorway. Uh, again, a real cool ode to the you know late eighties, early nineties um, sneaker. Them really cool imagery and the lookbook. So again, big up to the guys involved in this. Didn't take yourself too seriously. No pin rolls in sights, and just a really cool classic um, photography pieces there. Really recommend check it out. Very very cool. Anyway, one hour is up. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's excellent English show episode number two fifty, two hundred fifty episode. Thanks so much for everybody that's um, tuned into the show so far. Um, if you want to keep supporting the show, please like the video. If you're watching via YouTube. Um, if you're listening via the podcast app, please give me a five star review and share with your friends. But until then, I'll see you each other. I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Hopefully tomorrow. Uh, take care and have a good one. Bye.